Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you, Wes, John, for organizing everything. It's great to see some um, familiar faces out here and, um, from our TAG meeting, uh, the Hinckley Center, and the advisory board meeting, as well as a lot of uh, new people. So I'm glad to have this opportunity to talk um, about, about everything we have going on at, at USF of recent times. Um, so I might be the only chemical engineering professor here. I might not say too much chemistry overall today's topic. I might show you way more numbers than anybody else has shown you, though. So just keep in mind, some of it's just kind of high, higher level type things. Um, I'm kind of just get the laser pointer here. So let's see if I got here. So anyways, it's, uh, as John mentioned, I've had a few projects in the last uh, seven or eight years. So it's great to be part of the Hinckley family. Uh, Tim Vince has been great, John's been great, Wes I'm sure will be great in taking over that, that part. Um, this work has been, the web talk today has been primarily funded about, by the Hinckley Center. Um, so Devin Walker is the uh, CEO of T2C Energy, that's going to have my disclosure there. It's a startup company at USF, so just to disclose that what he talked about. I won't talk too much about that, but we've uh, recently got a Department of Energy grant um, for the company, some of the work subcontracted USF, so a little bit of this touches on that as well and some of the Florida high-tech corridor and things. So just kind of want to mention all, all these things uh, just kind of up front here as well. So here's the people that did the primary part of this work. So on the left there is uh, Nada El Saeed. She just graduated with her PhD um, a few months ago, so entering the working world um, in, in, um, in May, I guess, or April. Uh, so she did her PhD in a lot of the Hinckley projects and finished. She, she won one of the graduate uh, outstanding researcher awards there with that plaque. Uh, the top right is Tony. He was unable to, he's an undergrad, just finished his honors thesis on part of the project I'll talk about. He just graduated and taken the FE exam. Uh, if anybody wants to hire him, he needs to stay in Tampa because his wife, he also just got married. He's got a lot of things happening, I guess, um, um, as well. So he did his honors thesis on this. And then Babu Joseph is another faculty member who's um, worked with over several projects over a number of years. So I just want to acknowledge he's also contributing to this, this part here and make sure I get all the acknowledgments out of the way in case we run out of time a little bit towards the end here. So. Um, our group, or collective, um, had um, probably about 10 to 15 students, uh, undergrad, graduate level, um, working on generally waste energy. So we hope that USF is involved uh, heavily in the waste energy area. Um, so I'm talking to you guys this, this week. Uh, next week I'm talking to the energy people, so there'll be some of this, uh, the Florida Energy Systems Consortium in Lakeland, so it'll be a little bit similar message, but more, more on the energy side as well. So we have some... Pr um, pr Products here, electricity and fuel of some type is usually what we talk about, so we'll kind of keep it general at this stage. So we have a couple of different routes to go. So what our group has been really focused in thus far is on the landfill gas side. That's what the topic of this is. So we're talking about gas recovery. We've had several talks on that, a little bit on purification as well. So we'll touch on that a little bit more. And some of the chemical processing, we won't get into too much today, but I'll highlight a few things. So the chemical processing, because um, Really, when we get to the chemical processing, the really focus of this project we have here is we need to know how, how much we need to clean the gas up. So we have to pay to clean up the gas. We want to pay as, as little as possible, so have the gas as, as dirty as we can to not have any contamination downstream, but not necessarily any cleaner than we want it to be. So we talk about chemical processing. We've also worked a little bit in um, solid waste. So there's some numbers there. The EPA number usually gets thrown around of 250 million metric tons of waste per year, roughly 25% of that. Uh, a few people have mentioned the EREF in the other talks as well. So they did a different, a different study and they did about 40% more solid waste by uh, doing a different process in EPA. So anyways, a large amount of it ends up being a lot of it's food waste, diet, biodegradable. So there's um, some other uh, processes to look at getting the solid directly rather than um, looking at the gas recovery. So I'm not talking too much about that, that part, about that part today. So we have kind of starting with landfill gas. So as we do to energy projects, we generally want to have the methane as high as possible. That's the energy content, the carbon dioxide. For most energy products, just along for the ride. They want to keep it almost like an inert. We need to deal with it because it's there, but we don't we either have to pay to separate or deal with it being in the projects. We have energy potential. You know, roughly it's about half of methane, roughly speaking. So it's about half the energy content of landfill gas, or sorry, of, of natural gas. The challenge with this is natural gas is usually very large amounts and it get, helps to um, get this rem remotely because you have very large amounts of natural gas, landfill gas, or other biogas sources are smaller, so there's an economy of scale issue we have in this, which I'll touch on a few times. We have safety, so there's a lot of aspects related to the methane being explosion, having potential for um, um, fires, potential for other things, a lot of safety-related things, breathing hazards, this is even more so 
Um, in certain cases, when it's not ventilated well, which is not outside, we have some issues with safety. And also we have some environmental concerns as well here. So the um, methane emissions in 2013 are there. So about 18% comes from uh, landfills and a lot of it comes from agriculture as, as well and you can um, I've shown pictures before so you can just see right now North Dakota just lights up the sky with the flares with all the amount of natural gas that's too remote to take out of this so we have these different aspects that all make this want to take into account the energy content of this um, however we have these other issues here so with some processes the oxygen and nitrogen may cause a problem and generally those are okay but we have these other kind of multiple layers of contaminants. I'll get more in the details of what all the contaminants are, but the big ones there are hydrogen sulfide, alkyl halides, and the merging ones, siloxanes, is not in this graph, which we'll spend the most time on because it's the more recent one. So we have these issues we need to take into account. Um, I worked in biogas purification uh, previously and then in the state of art and some of the bi thermochemical biomass conversion. To get rid of some of the contaminants in there, it was like 50% of the project cost just to remove the contaminants. So it could be very high and the new technologies are needed to get around that. So, that this will help identify some of, some of those causes there. So we're getting more depth in this can help identify some of these causes um, as we look at landfill gas. Uh, so here are some of the statistics you get out of this from the, these sources. These are probably fairly well known, but we have we generate a lot of um, um, garbage in the United States, 4.5 pounds per person um, uh, per day. A lot of the uh, developing countries, uh, Babu Joseph was in a um, sabbatical in India and he had some graphs from India it's just skyrocketing how much so it's still less than that per Indian person per day but it's increasing quite a bit as they develop a lot of their technologies and have more um, uh, waste they need to dispose of. Landfill gas there is about 6.5 6, um, 6 cubic feet per person per day so a pretty reasonable amount uh, based off just kind of the general values of how much gas comes out per pound of disposal and this number may be a little bit high there of the 2400 landfills but there's about 2000 landfills probably right now in the US and quite a number of them don't have um, utilization projects and these are generally ones maybe on the more side of having around 500 uh, cubic square feet I'll show some stats on that later so there's a large potential here for energy projects as we move forward and try to take the valuable resource that we have out of energy out of that methane energy so kind of take a look back um, kind of here we kind of frame this problem. We're looking at this part, this part primarily right now of looking at the fuel synthesis, landfill gas, and syn gas production. So one of our re previous research projects on the Hinckley Foundation, which is the one Devin was talking about yesterday, was more on this, this syn gas production and fuel synthesis. And he told you a lot of the information for that already. I won't cover too much of that part. And this is just an example I have of other biomass conversion processes also have um, a lot of waste that can be generated. And there's really only um, right now maybe a handful of options available and it's hard to delineate which one was necessarily the best. So the flaring the gas is obviously the easiest. Um, electricity is the most common. Other people are proposing um, liquefied natural gas. I don't, we haven't done any work necessarily on electricity via fuel cells, but in Europe that's also a very common one. People are trying to look at fuel cells to generate electricity. And the one we've focused on primarily is making diesel fuel, so about 8,000 gallons per day is what you could get from a typical size landfill. No, so kind of skip that. and. This is probably one slide that Devin showed yesterday. We have a nice closed loop if we make fuels because uh, the waste industry uses about 4% 4, 4 of all diesel generated. So if you can des generate diesel back from that, from that source, you can have a nice closed loop here and end up being a typical size landfill can generate about twice as much fuel as what the uh, industry needs. And it would also be able to supply all the on-site on -site diesel fuel as well that's used for um, off-road off -road uses. So that gives kind of opportunity we have for that specific project. Um, we've you know, and right now, I'm kind of looking more holistic of all the options available. So these are the typical ones we would look at and some of the qualitative features you have that. So flaring's cheap and easy. You don't get to use the energy. So there's some downside there. It ends up being the cheapest implement, too. And I think I have that on in one more slide. Electricity has been widely adopted. And a number of people here are doing that. You're able to decrease some amount of waste. Um, you have some cheaper options for electricity. So usually on what you're generating, you're not quite getting as much value as what because uh, your people are typically selling are buying it from you for what they're producing and at what they're, what they're selling at. So there's some low product value, and generally speaking. Um, compressed natural gas is kind of an emerging one. One of the challenges is I don't have necessarily here is it's scalable. You get pipeline quality, um, equipment operation needs, and there's cheaper alternatives. One of the other weaknesses this is this varies quite a bit from country to country, what, what, what um, specs they have on what would be considered pipeline level gas. Um, people have also use this um, more so in the last probably decade as well for transportation fuels for CNG. And that is uh, something that kind of hovers back and forth over, over time. And um, 
uh, even uh, some of the school districts and as well as the municipal solid waste industry has done that. And we've been looking at um, liquid fuel production. So we value added products. So typically if you make uh, um, fuels, um, the same energy content of a fuel, of a you know, diesel fuel for example, versus the same energy content in electricity, the commodity of diesel fuel, since it's very portable, on demand, et cetera, makes, makes that fuel, makes that same energy content worth about five times more, roughly speaking, of just by having it in demand, available product, uh, storable, et cetera. So, and then the downside here is we're still under development on that specific technique. Uh, I wanted to throw this in here just so we could have kind of a, a general um, scope of what kind of size and magnitude here. So this is a science advances paper that just came out. They looked at the history of all plastic generation. So they have a number of statistics there. So they looked at 83 million metric tons. So sorry if I mix English and um, metric units here too much, but 83 million tons have been generated. 6,300 million metric tons have been discarded. And primarily that's in um, landfills. A reasonable amount of number of that uh, ends up in the, like the Pacific Ocean. You probably hear those stories as well about the plastic in the Pacific Ocean. So if you look at the next, the third line of that, of that waste, a little bit's been recycled, a little bit's been incinerated. Almost all of it that's been discarded has been landfills, so 79%. So I did bring my one prop here. So this is probably the most common thing we see, right? Landfills, this is here. So I had to, I'm too cheap to buy a water bottle at the airport, so I have to have a, a case of these. So when I go to the airport, drink it, empty it out, fill it up on the other side of the gate. So um, just too much to spend $4 for that. But we do, even people, we use much more than that. There's a lot of this ends up in, in landfills. So, and they projected based off, you know, plastics is an in increasing demand. You know, we didn't have all these plastic products, you know, in 1950 when this is started. Um, they expect 12,000 million metric tons by 2050 that'll be a landfill or in the environment. That's, so more would be generated. This number here is in a, uh, not in this research area, but here I know a number of people are really working on this last one here. So how do we make plastics that are from biodegradable, bio-based bio products? Only 4 million, so only what, 4, 4 million out of 12,000 million is a very small percentage, right, of very biodegradable. So there's a very emerging market that could exist for that. And um, kind of last bullet here is 13 percent um, is plastics of our solid waste before recycling. So that's just the number you grab from the EPA website. So this is all, you know, kind of very, very large numbers. It's scary when you look at this. And this, uh, these people, just, these people from Santa Barbara, University of California, Santa Barbara, um, come out here. But if we put this in terms of energy needs in the U.S. We wrote a review paper with a different project, and I'll have that here. Only if all, take all the CO2 emissions that are coming out, like from fuels, from uh, electricity generation, and you were able to capture that CO2, the carbon in it, and convert it to plastics, you would only need 1% of that CO2 to make all the, less than 1% to make all the plastics in the world. So even though we have all these plastics, all these numbers are gigantic, the scale of it is very small. So we have some other projects in CO2 conversion. One of my graduate students is here. He may have talked to you about that because we have an NSF project for that as well. So very small. And I have another numbers here just to kind of say if we, the need we have for energy dense fuels here is that this is the number. The number, if you look this up, it'll end up being like 95, 96 million barrels of crude oil per day. So total what's coming out of the ground um, per day. So I had to under that per day. 25% of that is used in U.S. Only 4% of the pop world population is U.S., so you can see how we get a disproportionate amount of the cheap fuel that's used that. But if you look at the density of this, convert this here, this is 4,500 million metric tons of crude oil coming out per year. So 4,500 million metric tons. This is you know, about, about the same order of magnitude over the course of like 60 years. So you can see the, just the sheer number of that. Um, I didn't put big up the stats here. So like one or two years of all the fuels we use ends up being equating to that. And the need for diesel fuel is expected to increase. I didn't put that number there. So as we get more um, electric vehicles that are doing the short-term transportation, if that does take off, we would have more diesels on the highways. So we have that. And then the fuel um, um, consumption or the efficiencies are very lower. The way I set this number here, 4%. And we have diesel and jet fuel are going to be the hardest fuels to replace. or energy dense, long trips. You know, I hear people go to conferences and they say, you know, the last, the last gallon of uh, fossil fuels will be used on an American fighter plane, Air Force fighter plane. It'll be the last, last gallon. So the Air Force has been one of the people trying to get the renewable fuels in well, but they need them in demand. So we have all this. So I said, uh, kind of, I don't have that number up here, but about 1%, less than 1% of all the CO2 emitted ends up and would be enough to supply all the plastics. For transportation, fuels would be about 40%. So if we took all the CO2 that's being emitted from everywhere, somehow converted that to fuel, 
it'd be about 40% of that diesel and the rest would be like coal basically, or natural gas electricity would fill the gap of the other 60%. So we have a kind of an economy of scale. So these numbers really kind of magnify the economy of scale. And that's where the chemical engineering part of this comes in. We really have to worry about scale because we can do a lot of things at small scale, lab scale. It just ends up being not economic as in many cases as we scale up the technology. So we always have to keep that in mind from research to looking up to that. So here are the calculations we've done on this. I think Devin probably showed something similar to this yesterday. And this will be kind of the last overview slide I think I have in here. But you know, flaring is the easiest way. It doesn't cost too much. Uh, your net present worth decreases as you go forward. Electricity has um, generally being um, some revenue, some, some um, discounted cash flow rate of return, so being able to make some money. Um, compressed natural gas is here. It ends up being quite um, expensive to operate these. There's a lot of compressors, high pressure to get that in there, so it ends up being pretty high operational expenses. Though you still have some profit there, and what we're doing in the liquid fuels area is probably um, commensurate in a lot of aspects, uh, but because basically the product is worth five times more in you know, fuels than um, it is in electricity, we end up being um, uh, quite high on that. And you see some of the tiers. This is a little bit on the large side of the landfill. This is without subsidies, so probably the most amazing thing when um, Devin and Tim is here present all these economic things is right now the renewable fuel credit gives you like $4 per gallon of drop-in fuel as, this, as a, as a, as a um, incentive. So $4 per gallon ends up being, you can see, much more than we make from make the fuel. So you make more incentives to make the fuel than you make in the fuel or in there. And so pretty relatively low um, break-even price. So we have these things in here. I'll come back to some of these assumptions later as we go through. So. We have to kind of keep these various factors in mind. So this kind of gives an outline of what our specific most recent Hinkley project is that finished in February. So we talked about um, contaminants, so what, what they are, how much there are, wh how much is coming out of landfills. Um, we're talk we did some process modeling for the landfill gas cleanup, and that's really where the tolerances come in for specific pro processes. And we spent some time looking at siloxanes. I mentioned that a couple times. That is our emerging, as an emerging contaminant. And I'll get into that in a second um, in there. So that's what we focused on for our, kind of our three, three initiatives for our project that just ended. So um, a lot of the background is published in this review paper that we came out earlier this year. So you can see some requirements, techniques, and contaminant removal from landfill gas. We focused a lot on adsorption. But I mentioned the scale a lot, so we end up having to worry about scale. So composition ranges, flow rates, tolerances, so we need to know how much is in the gas, concentration, how much of the gas is coming, how much it was allowed to come out, and how much of that costs. So that ends up being a lot of the factors involved with that. Um, so in coming into the next part, I probably apologize for some very large tables. Uh, I'll try to simplify them a little bit. But here's, so I mentioned two contaminants before. So in reality, those two contaminants are very simplified. This is what we have for the contaminants. So this is, this is a shortened version of like five pages of tables that are at the supporting information of that review paper that I showed. So there's a lot of stuff in here. So I grouped them together just to kind of, there's several siloxanes. Here's your sulfur compounds. Most of it's hydrogen sulfide. You got alkyl halides that are down there. All out of hydrocarbons that aren't methane. And we got not too many mercury compounds, but they're buried at the bottom. So those are the main things uh, we have to worry about. Um, specifically, we talked about, we focused on siloxane and sulfur for their um, quite high the NMOCs or maybe a, organic compounds are maybe a little bit less worried about. Halides are something that we think is going to come out anyways with some of the activated carbon beds and mercury. We're aware that that could always be a problem depending because that, that fluctuates quite a bit from landfill to landfill. You can't see that number down there at the bottom right, but it says between, it ranges between 2 and 91 in the unit. So you can see it's a gigantic amount of potential range that could occur there. Okay, so here's a very, another very large table. So just to kind of highlight everything, we have technologies on this side. So fuel cells, engines, natural gas, the grid, no, more engines and vehicle fuel. A whole bunch of things, a whole bunch of boxes or references, um, some specific sources we have there. And I mentioned we've been focused on hydrogen sulfide and siloxanes. This is very, um, you know, getting detailed more. And so one, our third focus was there is catalytic conversion. The siloxane tolerance is not known for that. So that was how we ended up with doing that third task I mentioned there. Um, and if you kind of just can't necessarily see it now, but um, Stirling engines are the most generous. 
can then combustion engines and then turbines and then fuel cells are the most tolerant of those ones that are in there. So there's a range in there. So it's going to cost more to remove the contaminants for the ones that have lower tolerances um, in there. So very kind of in-depth literature review there. I want to spend a little bit talking about siloxanes here. So just to kind of remind us, we, um, we have a, a range of siloxanes and they're barely um, talked about if they're cyclical. Um, they have the D and then the number of siloxane, silicon atoms in there end up being that number. And if they're linear, they're L and then the number of silicon atoms as well. So they're kind of summarized in here, a little bit abbreviated table. We have kind of abbreviated versions of all these sulfides and other contaminants could, that could be allowed to be there. So probably most of our other slides here will have these abbreviated off on the side. Um, this was probably, and I'll get a little bit more detail maybe in one, in one more minute, but um, this was probably one of the things that uh, kind of surprised me most when we got started in this is um, siloxanes weren't really used at all before um, 1995, 1999. I forget the numbers. So on the left side we have here, this is a web of science search, is the number of published items with the term siloxane and landfill gas together in it. So you can see it's exponential. Um, drop off here. So the last, the last year is 2016. That just happens we did it late in 2016, so all the papers weren't out yet. And this is the citations of those papers. So um, it's again, kind of following the same, the same trend there. There's nothing basically before 1995 in either one of these cases. And you can see this, at least in the academic literature, these are only talking like 20. And really those are only over the last time years. So like 100 papers total maybe. So very few people have looked into this as of about a year ago. Um, so we looked at uh, more in depth on this particular topic um, and just kind of summarize these things as siloxanes use are increasing, uh, contaminant regulations are generally increasing, waste to tolerance um, tolerances are decreasing or maintaining. Um, so we need to have some better understanding of these removal processes. So you may, you may ask us why do we even need siloxanes in these things and we'll see um, Somebody gets my joke here is because we want to have our hair be shiny. So, okay, you got My four-year-old daughter said you guys would all get this joke. Anybody seen Moana? No? Oh, we got two, two three, four people. She, it's her, she likes this movie a lot. She thought you guys would all get this. It's a very detailed song. I won't sing in this, but um, that's a very shiny crab in the back. So Moana's a Disney movie from last year, so she thought this would be pretty funny. I'll try to tell her it wasn't. Oh, okay. Okay. So here's a little bit more detail in that part. So the first, actually the first patent on siloxanes is like late, late last century. So just um, here, and this is from a different earlier paper. Um, here's just some statistics on what, what is um, increasing. So there's a review paper uh, here just specifically on the chemistry and the environment of siloxanes. So everything I have there is increasing. You can see increasing here, increasing here. Here's just a, ra a random news article I came across. So Avonic makes a lot of silicon products. So they're expected to increase quite a bit. That came out about a year and a half ago. Or so um, the environmental impact of these are not particularly well known. They're not really regulated right now. So this, they don't decompose very easily either. So I'd add that part. So they it became news. That, so this is chemical engineering news from the American Chemical Society. So they found them in Antarctic soil and marine life since they were able to trans be transported and um, up to anywhere and aren't able to decompose. So you can see that part there. Um, I think I'm missing the slide here. So this part here is siloxanes are also one of the major indoor off-gas products. So all these people put them in their hair, put them in their skin. It's in everywhere. So this is a, at a university. They studied this. So you can see um, these spikes here. This is D4, D5, D6, and CO2. So this is like this class schedule. You can see people come in the room. The siloxane in the gas phase you know, shoots up. It decreases after people there. And the class ends, new class starts. It goes back up and does this over the course of the day. So this ends up being um, uh, in the air. And you can see the supplier at the bottom here. So all these lines at the bottom is saying there's none of it coming in the room. It's all coming off the people. So the off, off uh, leave-in products, I should say. And you can see this part is the D4 and D5 um, here is starting to be regulated more in Europe. So there's some maximum for wash-off products. It would be like shampoos and conditioners, mainly conditioners, I guess. And then there's becoming more things for um, leave-in products so, as well. So they're starting to delineate this. And this was the first, uh, this, this agency was the only one I saw that was regulating it in Europe um, in the last, this, this is just, just a couple months ago, I, think, I guess. OK, so all this is very tangential to me. So I had to pick on one of my undergrad students here is, 
he was doing this. I don't think he thought it was overly important. Then one day he sends me this picture of this product his, his now mother-in-law is using, so hopefully none of you know her. And he's like, I was looking at some stuff and all of a sudden, you know, people are handing me these ingredient bottles to look at and I found siloxanes in it. I think this stuff's really important now. <laughs> so that one's kind of kind of funny. That's Tony doing some stuff over there. So he, he really got convinced we were doing something really important with his personal interactions. That's one of the joys of uh, being faculty and everything is when they really get a connection to the, to the research in here. So that was my picking on of Tony, Tony here. So you know, all the other statistics doesn't bother him. That was the main thing. And you guys are probably familiar with some of these pictures here. This is a paper uh, that came out a couple of years ago and it just had a lot of basically siloxanes everywhere in an electricity generation plant. So you can see them. It's labeled. It's, um, you know, it's on here, on the, um, the cylinder head. Uh, it's on the rotator blades, it's on the um, spark plugs, so it basically ends up everywhere. They don't decompose. They get they decompose to silica, SiO2 from that. So, um, so we, we started this and kind of get into more of the details. And I have some more tables, maybe a little bit smaller than before. Is just um, how much siloxanes we have coming out here. So when we think about scale and how we do this, and that'll make maybe a little more sense in a couple more slides. Is we have to look at how much landfill gas we have here. So it's one thing to know the siloxanes concentration, which is reported. Frequently, it's another thing to know how much of we have. So we have a whole range, and I have some different units here in uh, English and metric um, here. So this is just a typical uh, a landfill methane outreach program stats you can download and look at this. I downloaded it in, 26, in late 2016, I think, and looked at it last. So the key part here is you know some landfills are very large, um, some fraction of it still gets landfilled, some can be very small, and you can see the minimum here. And I averaged, I kind of look at, so we, this, when we get the 2,500 number, we're looking at this mean, so just averaging those compounds, and about 80% gets used, for the 20% the gets flared, and just to keep in mind, there, this, there could be some slight shift in reality from these averages, because this only, this only reports values that are used, or facilities are used for waste energy products, so if you're just flaring, they don't get included in this value, so they could be shifted a little bit towards the high end, presuming that the waste energy plants are more on the high end thing. So. We get 2,500. We use 1,500, S and I'm talking about SCFM now is another one because that, uh, that, the mean versus the median difference ends up being about fairly substantial. So those are the numbers you might see: 1,500, mostly 2,500 SCFM for that. A kind of abbreviated version of what we can have uh, here as well. So I broke this up. We focus mainly on hydrogen sulfide and siloxane. So landfill gas. This is wet gas. A lot of anaerobic digestion occurs to get rid of organic compounds and wastewater treatments. So that's wastewater treatment plant. There's also a lot of um, uh, data available on those. So we have the highest we could find in the literature and a typical value. So you can see there's, again, quite, quite a bit of range for landfill gas. Most of them end up being in this range in the less than 100 ppm by volume. And siloxanes also can be quite a bit of range, but less so. Um, less than, so we used 15 milligrams per meter cubed as a lot of our values for the statistics. I left the wastewater treatment here just to show that there must be a lot more siloxanes and the wash-off products that go down the, you know, in the shower, then they end up being in there. So you can see this is almost an order of magnitude higher here, and is what, the order of three on the average. Um, we also have some, uh, we've also looked at some values related to agriculture, so there's some increasing number of farms, and, well, including one we vi I visited uh, a few months ago. It also have a fairly high uh, biogas flow rates on the order of 1,500, 1,000 or 1,500 SCFM. They also they don't have siloxanes, but they have fairly high hydrogen sulfide, and um, it's kind of a, it's kind of amazing to see like 700 um, cows making milk end up making about 1,500 S SCFM uh, biogas when you do the digester from the from the waste. So it ends up being fairly eye-opening there as well, um, which uh, is, is interesting, interesting in itself. So. We won't focus too much on sulfur here, and this is why. So this is from natural gas. This is a shell fact sheet. You can, if you Google it, you'll be able to find it there. But um, they are trying to sell one of their products here, which I don't know if we'll tell exactly. But they have this nice graph here that shows things. So we have hydrogen sulfide concentration, and this would be a natural gas, gas flow rate. And they have all these different technologies, and then this tells you how much is in each one if you remove it. So it's you know, 50 kilograms per day sulfur removed, 20 tons per day, 50 tons per day. And this is where the economy of scale comes in. The scale comes into these factors here. So um, if we put this here, if you look back in the previous two slides, I, these are the numbers once you convert the units of the highest you'd have in landfill gas of concentration, and the highest gas flow rate you'd have. And we switched the units, so it may not be hard, maybe hard to do that. You get in this range right in the middle of this graph, right? So you have the highest concentration of sulfur, the largest flow rate of gas. You, may, you basically have a lot of technologies you can use. 
you look at mean and median and typical, this, this ends up being here would be on the order of um, those 1,500, 2,000, 2,500 SCFM once you get the units there into the metric system. And here you end up being down in this part. So we're talking about, you know, kilograms per day now, right? 20 kilograms per day. And that ends up being very, very small scale. And you, even if you're, you know, approaching a larger landfill or a high concentration, you're really going to be end up in this situation here. So we end up in a situation, if you can still read that there, is non-regenerable solids and liquids. So, you know, using adsorbents, throwing them away ends up being what would be the from the natural ceiling from the natural gas industry would be the way you would want to do this in the most economical way using using this chart here. So that's we kind of main focus. We end up um, even large, relatively large systems, high contaminants ends up being in the smaller smaller box here in the bottom corner. And you can see there's you know, six, five, six technologies there, all that are able to remove hydrogen sulfide. So there's a lot of information available and costing information available on what is used in industry currently at larger scales typically. Okay, so we have a couple, maybe one or two more very large tables. This is our compilation of literature, and this is uh, my main part here is these are all activated carbon, zeolites, and silica gels, and these are the capacities they reported in the references. And this is like scary to think about these studies, even in the same study here, they were a factor of six difference here. Um, and if you look at this highest one report, I have the box here, it's, almost, it's more than one gram of D4 per gram of media, down to four milligrams. So we, I did, so we did some in-depth part of this, and these ones that are very low tend to be from uh, coconut pyrolysis. So I don't know if there's any connection to that or not, but the ones that are very low end up being from there. Um, I have another hypothesis as well, which I'll mention in a second. But another thing to mention a lot, I don't have the details for these, but a lot of end up being in simulated media, which you can see some of these here is um, D4 and nitrogen, et cetera. The biggest probably challenge for this, and I'll get to see what I got up here, is these val I already said this values very widely. This is probably the, the reason I think everything varies so much is people don't report relative humidity in the literature. So we, we have found very limited data and it, it is basically an on-off function for adsorption. So these um, absolute or relative anything in there. And the kind of last comment is people only been really looking at siloxane's adsorbent like advanced like functioning materials, these bottom ones. These are from the University of Connecticut, the bottom three there. Uh, yeah, the, these, these bottom three. Really try to make specific things for siloxane removal as opposed to just your standard um, activated carbon, silica gel, zeolite, et cetera. So we're looking at things not off the shelf, actually making something new and better. And they tend to be, tend to be higher down there. So it again, it goes back to this being an emerging area. Those are only papers only from the last couple of years. Okay, so we also look, compiled all the literature on siloxane costs here. So I'm not going to expect you guys to read this. I'm just going to summarize it here. So most of the studies are on low flow rates and high hydrogen sulfide amounts. Um, mass on a contaminant basis ends up being not very good to use because the amount of contaminants varies quite a bit. So it ends up being better to compare on a cost per gas of volume processed. Um, and that's what this column is. This ends up being between one cent and ten cents, per, particularly per meter cubed. And that makes some sense because if you talk about you're having some flow rate of landfill gas, you have to process all the gas. You have to pump it. You have to do that. You have to pump it all through a bed. There could be pressure loss, et cetera. You need to have a size of these based off of um, how much gas flow there is. There's some sense that this might be a better metric, even though intuitively it seems like cost per contaminant removal would be good. And, um, and I don't have a specific value here, but if you have small amounts of siloxane, you need to remove them. It ends up being quite costly to add additional equipment in there just to remove these small amounts of contaminants. So that's where the tolerance level is quite big. And all these big tables I'm kind of just highlighting here all in that review paper we just showed a little bit. Um, and some people have studied adsorbent regeneration with these. And here, um, kind of just to summarize here is a lot of information is silica ends up being better to regenerate, whereas at most studies are on activated carbon and people either think it's not very good or it's very cheap so they don't study the regeneration very well because there's some um, overall cycle we have to worry about in terms of what do, what do we do with the spent carbon? You throw it right back in the landfill. If you don't phase the change of the siloxanes, it's going to come right back up and we're going to have the same problem magnified later on. So this is something we're aware of that we're not, act we're not necessarily actively working in at this point in time. Um, kind of switch gears a little bit here is what this goes to Tony Elwell's thesis, so his honors thesis. We have a paper in review on this part here um, as well, so kind of highlight some of the calculations we did. Here is what we um, did for the basic system is we looked at basically the iron sponge is the unofficial name for this to remove sulfur is this uh, kind of standard thing people use for low, low flow rates. You end up with an, an iron sulfide. 
And if it's large enough, you could do something else to re regenerate the process. There's a, one of the, cop, uh, one of the um, trademark words there to do that. Water is generally good for this process. There's some hydroxide intermediate there, so you want to, kind of, you want to have the water in, don't want to knock the water out yet. We have a chiller slash compressor, however we want to do this, but do something where we can knock out, knock out the water. Um, because one of the issues I mentioned a couple times, whatever we put here is going to be some sensitivity to water. Um, so we need to knock that out so there's not um, competitive. And then we could scale these particular two to, to um, knock out you know, a certain amount of iron sulfide, a certain amount of siloxanes. This would probably end up being activated carbon. And if it's not, you'd probably have to put an activated carbon bed here. We did not cost that. And that would be able to be a polishing type step. And you would be able to also take out anything. A lot of things is where we are here to talk on that today. Activated carbon. So that would add some cost in there we have not considered. But uh, just to kind of keep that in mind. Uh, here's our one equation. We did this all in a, uh, a, a multi-physics flow model called ComSol's the project we, or the program we did this. So just solving all the material balances, um, capacities. So we, just, we, have, we have some flow term. We have some capacity of the adsorbent we got from the literature. Um, we can solve all the equations for that. I mentioned there's very little data on relative humidity. So we had to take, kind of take into account from um, some ranges of um, values of limited literature, so that's one potential. Um, and we also took into account pressure drop as well. So we have, um, we end up running, I think, about 170 different simulations to come up with the data. I'll kind of summarize here. Um, so this would be a typical value type of graph we'd get is uh, days to breakthrough, removing siloxanes. And you can see the, um, some of the details down here for activated carbon and silica gel as a function of relative humidity. So if we get this on off value ends up being 45, 55% approximately. So basically nothing happens once we get to too much humidity. The water absorbs preferentially over the siloxanes. So we don't get anything absorbed. We can't remove them out. And based off of um, these capacities, we can come up with these days to break through. I don't have necessarily a goal here. We're trying to get half a year before breakthrough so we could have the absorbent last for half a year, only replace it twice, so replace it twice a year. Uh, so you may see some different bed lengths or bed heights here to, to counteract that. Um, and here's just kind of a, another represented graph here that shows us now we have three different, en three different applications. These all have different tolerances. Engines would be the lowest, most lenient. Fuel cells are the most, le most least forgiving, most forgiving. And the catalysis option for fuel production ends up being in the middle. And we could scale these uh, here so you could see um, ends up being fairly low for these more sensitive applications. So you need to make a larger bed to be able to get to the 200 days. So here you need to double or triple the size of the bed. So more material, more, more capital and replace operating costs to do that. And engines, in this case, there's only two points here. You wouldn't necessarily need to have, if you have the highest tolerance, you don't necessarily need to have uh, um, any removal process for the siloxanes if the, for specific engines if it's that high enough. So there may be other applications as well where you're above the range. You don't have to worry about it. OK, so here's um, another kind of regraph of that. So the only, um, we narrowed it to activated carbon, We're looking at the days to break through, looking at relative humidity. So pretty much this summary from this part is, is regardless of what we're doing, we need to knock out, of, we need to knock out usually the gas is at 100% relative humidity coming out. We need to knock off at least half the water um, through sort of chilling it and then letting it um, be undersaturated coming out of that. So kind of the main idea is we need to at least move out 50% of the water. So that's the chiller, chiller cost or the chiller process in the middle of that uh, situation. Because we don't want to pay to, um, we don't want to pay to have to any, any of the, um, just re regenerating the second absorbent bed from the water absorption. Uh, kind of on top of this, and we didn't model this, is it'd be, there'd be, we're taking this down to five degrees Celsius, but anything that uh, uh, has a vapor pressure in there, so organics that aren't methane or, you know, or um, alkyl halides, things that could condense in there would also come out in that water. So that water may be fairly dirty depending on exactly what's going into it. So just kind of as a, something we didn't include in here, but that would be um, add to the water uh, purification costs on that uh, situation. And yeah, I just want to kind of reiter reiterate that um, not every combination we ran had to have any process because if we had a low siloxane amount and a high tolerance, we didn't necessarily have to remove anything. So some of them have no cost for the tolerance. That if those combination metrics would be met, there would be no, no cost unless you wanted to do that. It wouldn't have to, wouldn't be have to happen just for the lifetime of the equipment. So here's kind of just an uh, outline of some of the more specific values. Here are the graphs. You can see this is when values, they, this is relative concentration. It increases. It goes across the dashed line. That's when it hits the breakthrough. We added different amounts of bed length here. So we add you know, more adsorbent for the more tolerant, uh, resist, less tolerant resistant processes. So you can see that's why the dashed line that's graphed here is moving down in these cases. Um, and 
even with the increasing of the um, bed length, we can mark the bed through concentration and then we basically work with these factors to get this to be around 180 days and we didn't go in between like values of these specific things so that just ends up being around what it was. We basically call that 100 days, half a year when we did the economics of everything. Okay, so here's kind of summarized everything. So this is the list of assumptions a lot there at the bottom. Um, so we you know, pay for piping, pay for the gas transport costs, pay for the condenser, pay for the fluid in there pay for replacing the activated carbon. Hopefully this thing lasts 15 years, so those are kind of the details. We have more than that, but we ran out of space here and then want a separate slide. But the kind of key part is we have annual cost, um, cost per contaminant removed, cost for volume of gas process, and then these would be percent of revenue and percent of the landfill gas price. So we, and then for the, some of these, the ones in parentheses end up being the cost specifically for siloxane. So, um, if you look at this annual cost here, it ends up being on the order of a million dollars per year for all of them. Once you, if you're assuming it invest into these, um, have to have the facility there for siloxanes, you have to have, it ends up being a similar cost, and that goes back to we end up processing similar, same amount of gas, so it ends up being similar cost. In all these cases, it ends up being around a third, 40% for the siloxane removal of the tow. We've used some previous data for the hydrogen sulfide as well. I don't have that, didn't specifically mention that, but some of the costs that we have the hydrogen sulfide, we took kind of a worst case scenario in the hydrogen sulfide. I think it was on the order of five or 600 ppm. So on the high side, so those values could be a little bit lower too if we uh, lower that amount, but not, not overly amount as long as we have the equipment there to re replace it. Um, um, so we have that, so it ends up being kind of, this value ends up being here. So I show the literature data, it's all about three cents, right? So we end up having all about three cents per amount of contaminant removed. Um, on a volume basis of gas, and again, about one third of that ends up being siloxanes. And this is probably the most re relevant thing in, within the realm of what we um, um, studied is the, the product is the landfill, percent of the landfill price, this ends up being very similar because we're talking about the, the percent you cost to clean up based off of the energy kind of, the cost of the energy kind of going in the process ends up being very similar. Um, and I mentioned these values are all pretty high because we did a worst case scenario, but when we talk about percent of revenue, when we have the product that's worth much more, ends up being a smaller amount, and fuel cells are about twice as efficient as engines, so you can see that number is roughly, roughly um, about a factor of two, so it ends up being, to make a value added product, there's some, some benefit of there as well. And we have this model set up so we could always run this for different scenarios. This is, you know, kind of screening basic, basic, big case, base case scenarios. Okay, so. I'll probably go through this third part a little bit quicker because this gets in a little more of the details of how we got the value for the um, contaminant removal part. Um, so I just want to say we, we mentioned before we didn't have any idea of what the exact contaminant removal tolerance or the tolerance was for the catalytic process. So we selected a model reaction and did simulated biogas so it's methane, CO2, and silica of uh, accelerated fashion. Um, which we'll get to the kind of one slide. So this is probably something that similar to what Devin showed. So we have Landfill gas with its contaminants, we have to pay to cliff, filter it. The process basically is you have one catalytic reforming process and a second one. So this uh, breaks up these, these two gases here into CO and hydrogen called syngas, and then we make the value added product from those. Uh, and there's a picture right down there. This is a drop in fuel, so it's not biodiesel. Um, the sulfur is coming out here, so it ends up being low, low sulfur and low aromatics. And the catalyst in these two processes end up being pretty key. We have a fairly generic separation here at the end and knock this out. Um, so, the, so the contaminants are here, so when we do this part, the reforming process is the one that takes the brunt of that. Whatever gets through here would be in this bed, it would probably glass up the silica and then we wouldn't have actually much here, so we focused on this step for the contaminant. Um, kind of went through that part here as well. Some people have actually looked at hot um, gas absorb, the decompo decomposition at temperature to do this, so there's a limited number of studies where People already saw some values, but we didn't have specific um, tolerance levels from that, and there's some of the references there. And uh, we did some tests in accelerated fashion because we need to have the siloxanes come out quicker, so we did some at using some sort of silica precursor to decompose, and we did some with just high concentrations of siloxanes, so I'll kind of um, skip through this part here and kind of cut to this part right here, so you can see um, we simulated things, we did things on the week, one month, and six month level, so team three time frames and compared those to un, un, untested. So we, yeah, we didn't run any tests for six months. Those are simulated six months based off the amount of silica there. Oh, just kind of go back here. So when we add, oh man, I'm going the wrong, I'm totally going the wrong way, aren't I? 
because we need a lot of characterization materials. The easiest one for us to look at right now is the catalyst by itself is black, and we add silica to it, it's white because silica is white. It's lighter because silica is white. Um, so you can see some things from just the mass gain and the color change. Um, we did a lot of tests to look at the very fact of these, so whether we could not see silica and then we can see silica. I, see my, I want to take some time for questions. So we did a lot of things. We know silica is there. We did some reaction tests to see what it was, and the kind of the summary of this situation is, I can just go, oh man, I got a lot of stuff here, is we need to remove most of the siloxanes. <laughs> so 96% so at most, based off of the one week sample, ends up being, we think prob probably could be okay, whereas the higher ones don't, so we have some values. We need to get below 0.2 milligrams per meter cube, so that gives us some of the values we used in the, it may not have been the exact same value we used in the simulation studies, so we were doing those in parallel. Um, but we have that value, so we need to get rid of the siloxanes in there. So, like I said, I want to take some questions. I just kind of summarize. We did a lot of the literature review on the contaminants. We did the process modeling on the gas cleanup, and we looked at the catalyst tolerances. And I'm, again, very happy to take any questions now. Shining gear, products, would uh, go away? <laughs> oh. If we stopped using them, yeah, so most, most of it is in personal care products. The, the other most common thing is our shiny cell phone cases, I think. I don't have statistics on that, but that's, that's the other place. So any plastic product that looks shiny could have some siloxanes in it beyond, plus go, the. Go, don't. Yeah, everything needs to be like mad, Oh, that would, that would be that, but I, I think it's the, the trend is going the opposite way. <laughs> so, so just a, but it also depends on the volatility, like the product. So if it's like a very pl plastic, it's going to decompose much lower, like maybe never, right? As opposed to personal hair products that go out in the wastewater, it can come out very, like immediately, basically, not immediately, but very quickly. So there are healthy facts to these salon things, correct? Uh, or so the, the only place that we saw any regulations was in is in Europe, and it was only on D4 and D5. And I've, one of them, the chemical industry is very adamant for, and I forget which one because it has very unique properties compared to the other siloxane. So one of them they'll fight back on more than the other one. Um, but it seems. Uh, Europe is ahead a little bit. No, no, I mean, not even like California or anybody that's more stringent on these type of things is regulating it that I'm aware of right now. John, thank you so okay, much. Thank, thank you.